So welcome. Today we're going to be talking about uh, chapter nine and writing cogent and persuasive essays. So essentially what you want to do, and I want to stress this a lot, is when you write an essay, you really want to bring your A game, your best effort, right? In order to do this, it is difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? So when you're writing an essay, it's not just simply summarizing and then evaluating what somebody else else did. But you, you're going a step further than that. It's part of summarizing. Yes, it will be partly summarizing some ideas or partly evaluate some ideas, but you're going to go further with that in that you're developing your own ideas. So a reason why you want to work on writing essays, get better at writing, is that it helps sharpen the ideas that you have. So you may initially have this kind of vague idea of like, well, I don't really agree with this issue. But once you start writing, you start to notice that once it's on you know, paper, it's on your computer, that those ideas may not be so easy or your, your position may not be so easy to the bet. So you really have to think about it, maybe refining ideas. And so you're trying to be convincing in the end you're trying to convince whoever is reading your paper that you do have a good point that you're right about the issue. Um, so that's really important. And of course, you know, you want to pass the course. Uh, so writing essays is a good skill for that because you will have to do that. So when we talk about writers, we're talking about writers with experience who have a particular goal in mind. Uh, they may have some sort of plan of attack, right? An approach to the issue. But they might have to revise those ideas. And that's kind of what I was alluding to right now. And this happens to me as well. When I'm writing something, I think I know what I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure, you know, that's the right idea. And then I do some more research. And I start looking into it a little bit deeper. And then I'm confronted with new evidence, new issues that I, was, that I had not thought about. And in the process, I need to maybe reconsider, oh, I thought I was right about this, but now that I understand the issues a bit more complicated, maybe I'm going to have to change my approach. So writing is a complicated process. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. You don't just sit there one day and just, you know, go on the computer and then suddenly you're done by five. That's not how writing an essay is going to work. Uh, professionally, in this class and any other examples uh, in the real world, that is not how good writing is done. Poor writing can be done that way, but good writing is not to be done that way. Even uh, well-known authors who've been writing most of their lives, uh, revision, reconsideration is all part of the normal process of writing. So be willing to rework your ideas. You may not stick with your initial idea, but you learn a lot of things. This is part of discovery. So how do you prepare to write? So what you want to do first is determine your thesis. What is your thesis? Your thesis is your main idea, your conclusion. It's what you're trying to prove. So it doesn't have to be Maybe even, you know, very long, maybe one sentence. What is your conclusion? What are you trying to do? So an example here, gun regulation might involve restricting the carrying of handguns to specific places or perhaps only to specific individuals. So your thesis here might be, you know, for or against the legal possession of automatic quick firing weapon, or it might just focus on handguns such as pistols. See how you're starting to narrow in on the idea. You're not talking about just all guns or all people. You need to start refining it because it does get complicated, right? And the second thing you want to do is that's where you start getting your research together and you start developing your ideas a little bit more. So 
again, changing your mind is not a bad thing at all. It's actually a very good thing. Uh, we tend to maybe consider that changing our minds, you know, that kind of be, you know, comes off as we, we don't really know what we're talking about, but it's actually the opposite. Being able to change your mind and reconsider shows growth, it shows that you really are open-minded. Um, in the case, for example, here, uh, laws concerning firearms, evidence about the incredible destructive power of handheld automatic weapons such as Uzis might convince you to argue for the banning of these weapons. So you may start off as, well, you want to propose that everybody should be able to carry a gun. Well, what about particular type of weapons? Are they really necessary, right? Do they fall in the category? So what you want to do here next is then start to develop an outline. How are you going to approach this? And so the step-by-step -step process is really the best way to develop your ideas. And here I have an outline structure. And I was told this when I was writing, 80% of the work you do in writing an essay is in the outline. You're giving is essentially a plan a blueprint to what the overall paper is going to be. So think of it like a house. Uh, you start trying to build a house without a blueprint, it's going to be a mess, right? You can, oh, this room doesn't really fit. This wall doesn't really fit. And now, you know, the walls are uneven. The room is a little weird. I've seen those houses where clearly they didn't have a good plan for the extension of the house. Another uh, idea that you might consider when you're thinking about this is robbing a bank, as terrible as that sounds. But if you're going to rob a bank, don't you need a plan? You just go in there and hope for the best. And I'm sure you've seen on TV uh, bank robbers who have no plan. Uh, they don't really know where the safe is. They didn't really stake out anything it usually ends terribly, right? They don't get away. Um, so coming into an essay without an outline is really very similar. You're coming there without any sort of plan. You're just hoping for the best, and usually that's not going to happen. So first, take a look at the structure. This is a very typical structure for um, most persuasive essays. Start with your conclusion. It really sounds counterintuitive. Usually, like in uh, story writing, we kind of wait to the very end to give you the point of the story or the lesson, right? That's not how it is for a persuasive essay. If you're gonna try to persuade somebody about an issue, you wanna start off first with what is the point of your essay? What are you gonna to try to prove? You know, that tells the reader if they're actually interested in this issue. If they're not interested in that, you know, for example, gun rights or anything like that, they're, they're not going to really want to continue on with your essay. Now, that being said, you it is possible you could convince somebody with really good persuasive writing to read on on a subject they didn't necessarily think that was interesting or important at first. So your thesis comes in the beginning usually just one sentence. What are you going to prove to me? Now, you're also in the introduction you're going to give me. This is roughly for this course, two to three reasons to back up your conclusion. How are you going to give me? What points are you going to point out? What facts are you going to bring to the table to show me that you're right about this particular conclusion. It does lead to that conclusion. Now, I say two or three reasons. There really isn't a limit necessarily, but for the purposes of the course and also just for your readers, you know, sanity that you're not including a hundred different reasons, you know, two to three really strong, convincing reasons should be enough. And number three on the introduction there. 
you want to provide a small roadmap for your essay. So what are you going to talk about? In general, what is the paper going to look like? So you might start the roadmap section as a couple of paragraphs of letting your reader know. First, I'm going to talk about the author's argument. I'm going to explain, you know, this person thinks that, you know, guns should be banned entirely. Then I'm going to provide, you know, my first reason why that doesn't really work. And your first reason is blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we sometimes need, you know, uh, protection, we need defense in some ways. And then you're going to introduce your second reason, a very short, you know, format. And then we're still in the introduction. What is your second reason, et cetera? And then you're going to say, well, I'm also going to entertain a possible objection to one of my reasons, or maybe even both, if you really want to make a really strong essay. Say, well, somebody might argue against me on reason one, but I will address that and repeat that. And that's, we're still in the roadmap, and then I will wrap it up, you know, with the conclusion on demonstrating that this is the case. So you're just giving a preview in the third section of the introduction. Very small, maybe a couple of paragraphs, but you really want to lay it out. So there are no surprises. It's a really boring uh, <laughs> murder mystery. That's one professor. Uh, one of my professors used to tell me, you're, you're giving everything up at the very beginning. There's no, you know, twist or surprise. Now for the body, this is where you actually get into the meat of it. When you try to start to transition. Well, assuming that your reader doesn't know anything about this issue, don't come in thinking that well, the professor knows everything about this. So I don't really have to explain, you know, ideas or issues. Actually, this is a technique that I was taught as well. Assume that your reader is lazy and stupid. It sounds mean, but why would they be lazy and stupid? This imaginary reader because they don't want to work too hard and try and figure things out. They want everything kind of spook fed for them. And that they're not going to get it right away. They're not going to see your ideas right away. That means you're really going to have to work on showing the connections step by step, guiding them through. And that's what you want to do in the first section of the body. You're summarizing the argument or the theory that you're talking about. What, what is the issue? What did this author say against gun rights? Lay it out. You know, you don't have to put every single uh, fact or any single, every single, you know, sentence that they talked about. What you're trying to do is give a good summary of, you know, the main points of what you're going to argue against. What elements do you disagree with with the author? Or just explaining what the author is saying. So maybe right away you're not disagreeing with them, but you're at least trying to explain, you know, where they're coming from and be generous about it. Uh, don't be very dismissive from the very beginning. Say, oh, they're stupid, they don't know anything. Rather, give them their best effort. They're not here to defend themselves. So try to give them their best effort of what they're trying to do here. But then you can transition. That's where you get to the reason number one, your first premise to your conclusion. Well, it makes some good points as I you know, summarized. However, I disagree with them for this particular reason. And you'll go into, and this is where you start bringing your evidence in of why it does it. Maybe probably statistics, maybe a study, you know, a book that you had read that was part of your paper something where you're going to provide something, right? And then reason two, is that's where you also try to and say, and another reason or another issue that I pointed out is blah, blah, blah. And then the next step is entertaining an objection. So this is like a debate. It's like an imaginary debate going back and forth. Okay, so you had your turn to talk. Now what would the other side say? What would their particular... Uh, defense, right? They're going to try to defend what they said. I said, well, you know, on that first point you made, and that first reason you said that I was wrong about this, 
perhaps, you know, you didn't understand me. Maybe I really meant it. And you would kind of pretend that you're that person for a little bit. But then you have a good answer, right? This is an imaginary debate. You have a good response to that. Say, well, okay, I see where you're coming from. However, but this is the issue. It's still there. Um, and your explanation doesn't really address the issue that I'm pointing. And you'll do maybe, this is why I said a stronger paper, maybe you're going to answer to both of their objections, right? So you, technically one is enough, but you know, if you want to add on a stronger, cover all the possible reasons you gave, defend all the reasons of what they could say against your reasons. And that's what a response is or a counterexample, uh, like we learned in logic, you're trying to pre present a side where it doesn't necessarily make sense what they're saying or why their response doesn't really cover everything that you're pointing that's wrong with the issue. And then finally, you're going to provide a conclusion. You're going to reassess, reanalyze your argument. Now, this doesn't just mean repeat everything you just said. Rather, it's going to kind of a summary of pointing now how the reasons work together and how their objections didn't really work in providing, you know, in support of your thesis, right? So you're, you're recapping, but you're not just repeating what you said in the introduction. Keep that in mind. So how are you going to prepare to do this other than developing the structure? And that's 80% of the work. So spend most of your time doing this. And once you have all these points filled out, it's going to be a lot easier to, to connect them and fill them in and, and create paragraphs and transitions if you know where you're going. So do diligent research. This is part of where we pointing at your reasons or premises, right? Make sure that you're working with the statistics. Make sure you're finding opinions of experts. You know, if there was a, our imaginary example here, if it was about gun rights, you know, somebody's personal opinion off the street, maybe it might be relevant, but you need something stronger. Um, perhaps you want to look at experts psychologists, uh, people who've studied uh, the effectiveness of guns and self-defense. You might want to look into that. Now, like I said, never ignore counter arguments for reasons, right? Keep in mind what the other person is going to say. So you're going to have to maybe perhaps go into law or regulation, learn a little bit better, saying, well, everybody should hold it. Well, what do the laws say right now? And stick to your best reasons. Don't kind of go off on a tangent of like, well, you know what? I want to talk about my own experience with the gun, whatever. Try to stick to the purpose of the paper. So make sure that it's step by step supporting your conclusion. And then, like I said, the structure of the paper, you know, the introduction, you know, the body, you know, the conclusion. But take, make sure you take a look back at those elements I had in the outline structure. So with the introduction, I kind of covered some of this. Uh, you're engaging the reader. You want to get their attention right away. You want to make them care about the issue that you're talking about. So don't begin the essay. This is probably known amongst philosophers. Don't begin the essay with so-and-so was one of the greatest philosophers in history. It's a cliche. It's going to be really disengaging and say, oh, this is really boring. Uh, this is going to sound like every other paper. Don't start your paper off like that. Instead, you're laying the groundwork right for your thesis. Why? What's the issue? And why should I believe that you have the best approach to this issue? And within the body, developing those reasons. This is where I, most of the work is going to be taking your time to get good evidence and good reasons together. Now, imagine again, the readers, your reader is lazy and stupid, but also 
perhaps maybe they don't agree with you. Imagine that the other side, they're really skeptical about what you have to say. Now, there is a point about to not hitting people over the head with what they already believe or you know. So perhaps, you know, if you said guns are a very deadly weapon, well, I think we all kind of know that, right? You don't really have to emphasize that. But maybe you want to approach it, what kind of gun, right? Is a semi-automatic, why is that much more dangerous than a regular handgun? or something like that. And then with the conclusion, you want to reinstate the thesis. Like I said, your emphasis, you develop your main point, but and this is a good point. Don't introduce some new ideas. This is, a, this is a mistake that some people make. This is not a time to bring in something you just thought up on the top of your head. And like, oh, that sounds really good. I want to hand that. You've already made a commitment. You already told. It's like doing directions, right? You already told us where you're going to go, and then suddenly at the very end, ah, uh, change my mind, let's go this direction. That's the really good throw off your leader and not be very convincing. So I had like, I emphasized, emphasized before, writing argument is providing convincing evidence. We're going to spend a lot of time with that. Sensible reasons are not good enough. What is it? What is that? Well, Perhaps you say, well, common sense, you know, tells us, you know, guns, you know, are dangerous things. Well, okay, but that's not going to convince everybody. <laughs> you want, this is where you want factual evidence. You want something to really back it up. So here's an example. My bother with college, and here, you, here's an example I say, is college worth not according to 57% of Americans who claim that our system of higher education fails to give students, quote, good value for the money they and their families spend. Well, now you have my attention, right? So, well, wait a minute, I'm a college student. Uh, what is this about the fact that it's a very surprising statistic, right? 57% of Americans are saying that. Well, now you have my attention. Times are tough and life is short, so why waste on college when all you can get for your money is a loan debt? And they do include a friend here as an example. That's that's not too bad as an introduction and as something you want to get their attention. But remember, that's not going to be strong enough just by itself. You're going to have to provide some numbers, some evidence of how many people are in debt, you know, nationwide. So they're going to say that I'm halfway through my freshman year and time to drop out. Going to college makes no sense economically and does little to prepare most students for the job market. And you see how, notice how they're putting some ideas in. It's too expensive. The job, job related courses I should take don't interest me. And besides, practical experience in the business world is worth more than academic education. So, reason one. Followed by the supporting evidence, high cost of college education and extensive uh, student debt. Most American colleges agree with it. College education and continue. So what did they do there? Let's kind of look at it a little bit deeper. What they did is they provided specific evidence. They used examples, right? These broad statistics. They compared and contrasted, you know, the different points, right, on the different sides. And then See how they're drawing on factual information. They're not just kind of saying, well, it sounds like a bad idea to me. I'm probably sure most people wouldn't, it wouldn't work out for them. See how that's very uh, empty. It's not very well substantiated. Bringing in 57% of people saying this, how much debt am I really going to incur? Those are really worthwhile information. So you may have the personal experiences, and I said it's not, you, I'm not, I don't want to say you can't use them entirely, but make them point out the factual information too as well. Don't simply just the story of how it didn't work out for you, why didn't it work out for you, what, how much did it cost, things like that. Uh, experiences of others, and 
and sources, right? Authoritative source experts on these issues, people who really studied and took a look at these issues. So if we continue with the example, it says, most Americans agree that college education costs too much. According to a Pew Research Center survey, 75% of college is too expensive for most people in the country, and costs keep going up. So again, they're bringing in sources. They're telling me, you know, the Pew Research Center, which is a very reputable, well-known research center, is giving us these statistics, right? And notice how in this example, we're also citing what as well. That's what those numbers are. They're tags to cite for where did you get this information from? So that's also part of what I want to see in your greater paper. Provide me information. Don't just say, well, 75% of people said this. Well, who said that? What, what research? Where did you get that information from? If I was skeptical, I would be asking this question. So remember, don't, don't assume that your reader already agrees with you. And then they bring in other elements there, right? That it would be about 68,500 in total if the cost stayed the same, about tuition, it keeps going up 6%. Um, as far as private colleges go, you know, $38,500 $38, price tag every year. Obviously, that's out of the range for a lot of us. And so notice they're, they're slowly building up. Why is it so expensive? See how all the numbers and information they gave us gave us reason to start reconsidering, you know, is it really that expensive? Maybe it is too expensive. And next, provide transition, good transition. So like I said, with the structure, the outline, you want to move from step-by-step -step with a transition. Don't abruptly change subjects and start talking about something else. Uh, it really confuses your reader. It's happened to me plenty of times when I've read students' papers. You know, something just, they didn't obviously make an outline because something they just remember popped in their head and they, in the middle of the essay writing, they're like, oh, by the way, and they started including this other information that they never talked about before or said they were going to talk about. And then I, as a reader, am like really confused. Where are you going with this? <laughs> you know, it looks really scattered brain and not a good, well thought out flow. Make it easy again for your reader to follow. So examples. It stands to reason that another advantage is those are telling me you're adding up, you know, your evidence. Now, another example here, continuing with our, our overall paper, notice what they say here, another major drawback in, is that the courses designed to prepare students for success in the job market don't interest me. And then they don't just leave it at that, right? Maybe it's personally don't find it exciting. They're going to also follow, but according to the College Board report, the hottest careers from 2008 to 2018 for graduates with bachelor's degree are education, accounting, and computers. Elementary, middle, and high school teachers are right up there along with accountants, auditors, and computer analysts. None of these fields interest me. What, am I, what I really want is a liberal arts major, but that won't prepare me for the job market. And they give, again, not just their opinion about it, but factual statistics about 56% of all graduates, you know in the class of 2010, got any jobs at all, right? So there's kind of showing how depressing the statistics are, you know, the evidence in, and they're making their point. And so think about your position carefully. Try to convince, you know, the reader about what you're trying to say here. Uh, speaking, kind of like over and above, uh, try to oversell it. Um, that's gonna help lose your reader. As a see through the tendency to hold up your views, root out inconsistency, arrange things coherently. I've seen this happen with many students as well. 
what they'll do is that they'll write something and say, well, I'm against this. You know, I'm against abortion. Okay. And then later in the paper, they'll say, well, there's some situations where I can see, like in cases of rape, where abortions should be, you know, allowed. Well, then why did you tell me no abortions should be allowed at the beginning? Keep consistent. Perhaps a better way to start off that paper would have been, in most cases, abortions shouldn't be allowed. But in some exceptions, like rape, they should be. If you started your paper off like that, then it's clear, it's more well-defined. Um, you're not starting too big. You're giving me a clearer example of precise you know, situations. So let's continue on with the example the book is providing. I admit that there are a few advantages to getting a college education. Well, can they really expand my knowledge, develop my communication skills, and probably make me into a well-rounded person. If I took more English classes, I could write better. The philosophy course would help me to reason more clearly. And so they're, notice what they're doing here. They're admitting that this is, this is important. They're going to see the other side. And they say, well, and like I said, try to present the other side in your objection with their best foot forward, the best presentation. Don't pick on you know, them uh, in the sense of, a poor presentation. Politicians do this a lot. They give a really poor presentation of the other side, the other politicians' position, you know, like the worst possible, you know, make, to make them look bad. But you don't want to do that. You should let the facts speak for themselves in, this, in that sense, in that you have enough good facts and examples to show why you don't have to do any sort of tricks or anything like that. So they're starting off, they're, they're giving all these really good, you know, examples how it could be beneficial. But notice what they say in the middle of this paper here. However, let's see that transition to me. An economist for the Brookings Institute once argued that the numbers are skewed because smarter kids are more likely to go to college to begin with. It stands to reason that if these smart, ambitious kids decide to go into business rather than college, they would have had a good chance of succeeding on the job as well. So see how that refusion kind of snuck in there? It's not tricky, you're letting them know, however, but you're trying to present both sides like that conversation I was talking about. So consider your audience. As a writer, again, do not forget who you're talking to. Imagine again, your reader is lazy and stupid. They're not going to give a lot of effort, so you're really going to have to work on your, you're going to have to really give the work, right? They're not going to meet you halfway. And past failures of writers remind them to engage the interests of the audience. Does this happen to me in my writing career where, you know, I thought, oh, that makes sense. This is going to be really good. And people were just confused, or they, I just lost them. And that taught me some lessons, right? Learning from my mistakes. Now I have a better sense of an audience, what they want to hear, and how to excuse me, be more convincing in what I'm trying to say. So when you're formulating ideas, at first you're gonna be hazy. It's okay. You don't, you're not gonna have a well-formed, perfect, you know, idea the first time, it's kind of like practicing anything, right? Throwing darts or whatever, you know, you might hit the bullseye, but that might be usually to luck. You have to work on, can you hit the bullseye again and again? That takes practice, right? So it's helpful to try ideas on other people. And I do this and I know everybody. I, when I'm thinking about something or writing something, I talk to others. What do others have to say? What do my friends have to say about this? Uh, particularly for me, it's really helpful to talk to other philosophers. I'm writing about philosophy. You know, they I know they have good ideas, they have good minds, they're very critical, so they're gonna give, you know, me, me really good feedback about what I need to focus on. What are my blind spots? And use the resources, right? 
accustomed to addressing a real audience. So what you want to do here is use things, elements, uh, approaches that are really helpful in getting people's attention. Notice how we started that paper there uh, regarding college tuition and the price and whether they go to college. They came right away with a attention grab, something that's going to catch the audience. So questions about the audience. What is the, what is the intended audience? Who are you thinking about who you're writing this for? What are their worldviews and background beliefs? So what assumptions they already have coming in? Those who all they don't have any assumptions. Maybe you know, they're going to be really tough if you're writing against uh, gun control and this papers for the NRA. They're going to be very skeptical, right? Um, what tone is appropriate for academic papers? You want a formal tone. You know, what you're writing for this class, you know, so kind of being very lax, using a lot of slang, uh, grammar issues. You know, don't write as you're talking to a friend, write as you're talking to somebody who's on the same level as you. But I would say, and this goes back to uh, trying out your ideas, talking to family and friends about your argument helps kind of clarify whether they're going to be convinced or not. If your family's not, or your friends are not convinced about what you're saying, then that might actually show you that maybe uh, maybe you need to go back and reconsider, right? So showing those blind spots. Now, writing the strength of, of your claims, how strong do you want your um, reasons, your claims to be? It's like threading the needle, which is the same. It's very difficult. It's, it's a very touchy issue. You don't. You want to be very careful about this. So making strong claims, right? Make strong arguments. A weak claim is providing sufficient evidence. But so you think, of course, I want strong reasons. But there's also an element here where you can go too far. A claim that is too strong is too difficult to defend with further privacy. Let's look at some examples here. Just kind of well flush out what I'm talking about. Steph Curry is the best point guard in the NBA. That's a strong play, right? Steph Curry is possibly, or maybe, or probably, or likely the best point guard in the NBA. Sounds kind of weak, right? It's like, well, maybe. Why am I reading this paper? But look at what the third example gives us. Steph Curry is necessarily, or definitely, or without a doubt, the best point guard in the NBA. I've seen a lot of these examples in uh, YouTube videos, right? There'll be some person and they'll be arguing that Steph Curry is the best of all time. You will try to defend that with some examples, but it's going to be really difficult to do that, right? Of all the players out of all the generations, uh, players in the NBA, or maybe even before, right? Uh, before there was an NBA, who's the best basketball player of all time? Those are really hard, kind of silly arguments at the bend. Oh, it's a lot more manageable to argue that Seth Curry is the best point guard in the NBA right now. There I can give some comparisons. There's not an overwhelming number of point guards. I can you know, just talk about the point guards that are in the NBA at this moment. And then lastly, the last piece of evidence I want to give you is rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. It's again not going to be a bullseye for the media. Don't expect it at all. Some of my favorite writers will, most of the time, it's not writing that first draft. That's not where it's been. Most, most of the time, they spend in revising back again, back again. It's also kind of like the 
analogy of uh, carving something, right? You're going to just carve out the, let's say if I was carving out of an animal, right? The horse or something. Well, the first time I kind of get that block of wood and I carve out the shape of a horse, it's going to be really rough. What am I going to have to do? I'll have to keep going back and refining more delicate work, have to sand it down, like see how the shape is not going to really come out until I spend a lot of time doing that, a lot of rewriting efforts. And that's why I do not try to write your paper late at night while drinking other drinks so you can stay awake. Uh, I made that mistake. I made when I first started college. Thought, oh, you know, just pull an all-nighter and I'll get this out. Um, what tended to happen, to be quite honest, is I woke up the next day and I read what I wrote and I was like, this is making sense. <laughs> and I'm really exhausted and tired and I can't read things, you know. And my whole day's kind of shot because uh, I'm trying to recover. And all I have to show for it is kind of a really poorly written paper. So take your time. It's not going to happen in one day. You know, you don't write a, no one writes a book in one day, usually. They, what good writers do is they write a page a day, and then before they know, it becomes a book. And I'm sure even after it becomes a book, they're going to go back and re-examine and rewrite. So these are some of the tips uh, and approaches that I want you to consider when writing your essays.